Hey guys, um, we are talking about how the Trinity orders life. And although there's a lot of um, conjecture about how our God is actually best described, um, because he's holy, he's majestic, he's beyond our finite brains. And, and let's, let's, um, let's be honest, if my two and a half pounds of um, operating brain um, or 2% of operating brain, maybe 10% if you're, you're lucky, um, can describe God and, and, and box him in, you're probably in a world of hurt. We're not trying to box God in, but what we're trying to look at is how does God organize life? And there's some, there's some pretty significant principles as you've read the Trinity worship book in this class and, and you're continuing to ponder over how God orders life, how he presses his life down into the simplicity of us individually. He does that through gender and identity. And then how he starts to blow that up into how we relate in family and then how we relate in bigger structures like commerce and government and now into the, the full scope of life. And God has a specific design for you. Um, something he's laid out in you from the very beginning. And how we've looked at this in the book is that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. And if you were to kind of pigeonhole one of the God members into kind of a, a role, if you could even do that, because they all kind of are in just mutual submission, you'd say the Father, you know, Jesus was very okay with saying that it's the, the Father's will, it's the Father's plans, it's the Father's decree, the will of God that Jesus do this or that. God kind, God the Father kind of holds the decrees. He's this, he's the kingly persona of just kind of having the script written out, the, the administration, the logistics kind of planned out. And Jesus Jesus, in his kingly role even, abides by those. And when we look at Jesus now sitting on the throne, the, the predominant way he's classified um, in the New Testament is one of the high priest interceding and that kind of focused on the people. He's interceding. And even though he's in a kingly role, he's ruling. It has less to do with necessarily like working on kind of the working on the plan. He's working in the plan. He's working with the people. He's he's centered there. And and you can see that kind of revealed in the Old Testament view of the king king type people. They were working kind of on the plan. They were providing the resources for those working in with the people. Like Nehemiah, you had King Cyrus who was kind of working the and, and well, and you could say King Cyrus and Nehemiah kind of working the resources, working the plan together, and then pressing that out. And as that plan started to press its way out and meet the people and and create friction with the people and all the good things and bad things that come with, you know, rebuilding the wall or um, doing a huge project together. Ezra was kind of this priestly person in there working in the nitty gritty of people's lives as they were remembering the law. They were coming back into the place of, of knowing God, repenting of some things, handling kind of the most relational things of, of coming to the altar, bearing your sin. That was kind of the priestly role. And then we see this, this, prophetic role all the way throughout the Old Testament as well, kind of illuminating or revealing God's Holy Spirit nature. It's not that he's any less of a ruler or any less than, but he kind of works in and among, if it's, if it's, Jesus is working kind of in and amongst people, the Holy Spirit is kind of working in and out through people. And so the prophets were one who lived in and amongst the people, but they were kind of the mouthpieces of the Lord. The Lord was pressing out his message. So you had kings who were more focused on kind of procedure. You had the priests who were more focused on people. And you had prophets who were more focused on precepts, the jot and tittle of the truth that was going to believe. And all three of these offices in the Old Testament, prophet, priest, and king, helped shape and keep the people of God, I believe, in a Trinitarian shape, okay? And we see that this comes to light in the New Testament in Jesus. He doesn't just show up as, a, as an individual missionary. We talked about that. He shows up with the Father, underneath the Father's plans, underneath the Father's will, in the power of the Holy Spirit. So he comes as a friendship. He comes as a family. He comes as a Trinity to kind of press out what I think God, well, obviously what God looks like. He said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But also to show that this common tripart, triune nature that began the garden, continued to press itself out through the office of king, prophet, and priest, 
now meets itself in the man of Jesus, who is called king, who's called prophet, who's called priest, even though these distinctions still lie with father, son, and spirit. So there's this remarkable unity. There's also this remarkable diversity in God. And I believe that he continues that three partite nature into the church today. He equips people who not who no longer, we don't see this in the New Testament as much with titles. And when you turn to the PPK outline, you're going to see a differentiation made between titles, types, and tendencies. Okay. And you see that in the book as well. We don't necessarily, we don't call people kings and prophets and priests today. We may be the priest of the believer, but nobody gets the big P priest. Jesus is the high priest. No one gets the big P prophet. Jesus is the prophet and the prophets of old. No one gets the big K king, but we have tendencies and they're fulfilled in types. Like you can see that some of the spiritual gifts, even some of them are more mouth related gifts, more preaching. Some of them are more administration, more kingly gifts. And some of them are more mercy, compassion, encouragement, more people related gifts. So even within the body of Christ, we have these things more focused, people giftings focus more on procedure, people giftings more focused on people and and giftings more focused on precept, people who are the mouthpiece, people who are the hands, and people who are the mind of Christ. We have this body and these tendencies kind of play out in us today. Even um, even though we don't get those specific titles, they're fulfilled in types. And no matter how you cut it, your life is going to play itself out through a, a particular lens. Okay, I can do music. And I know that I can play music that's more story oriented for story oriented, for instance, and it's more people oriented. But that's not how I'm wired. Where I get into music is more in the production and the and the recording side. So I'm very much more a kingly type person when it comes to music. How I lead is very kingly. I'm very much focused on the procedure of getting things done. Where when you get down kind of into the dealing with the musicians themselves, that's not where I'm the strongest and, and on and on and on. Okay. Where there's also in, in places where I, and it's not so compartmentalized to where I'm always this way because sometimes like with my family, I am definitely more profit in how I relate to people. And remember we were talking about the cross, how God communes, how he relates reasoning, how he does things, organization, how he orders life, scripture, how he believes and teaches, and signature mission, how he leads. And in more of how I commune with people and how I relate with people, I'm definitely more profitly geared. I want to relate kind of on right and wrong. I want to talk about teaching. I want to talk about right believing. I want to talk about those things. But when you put me into how I order life, I'm not necessarily profitly I don't necessarily first go to, I want to make sure I'm doing all the right things first. I'm more, no, I have the things I'm doing. I want to put them in the proper order. So I need like profitly type people to guard me to make sure I'm doing the right things. And when it comes to mission, I more want to jump in and organize everybody. That's my natural tendency. You can put me in a group full of people. You can put my wife in a group full of people. And I naturally am going to want to burst into flames if, if groups aren't, finding what they're supposed to be doing, if people aren't kind of lining up where they're supposed to, if everybody if everybody doesn't have a job or everybody doesn't have a clear sense of what they're doing or where they're going, it kind of bothers me. My wife, she jumps right in, doesn't care if there's a plan, doesn't care. The only thing she cares about is, I want to relate to this person. I want to be around this person. That tendency, she carries with her everywhere she go, goes. So this prophet, priest, a king assessment, I want to talk a little bit about how we're relating to it in the order of life. You can read this beginning part. It kind of explains what I just shared. It gives a disclaimer. I'm happy to talk through that with you as you go through the course. But you're going to come to the survey and it's going to ask a series of questions and you can, it's a fillable outline. You can go ahead and circle numbers and you're going to notice probably some patterns that some of the questions are deal, dealt more with, you know, people who are probably procedure minded, people who are more people minded, people who are probably predominantly more preset minded. And as you go through and answer this question one through five, you're going to go all the way th down through and you're going to see it separated out into the cross categories. Okay. Um, at the top here, we have how you relate community and fellowship how you do things, 
your reasoning, how you carry out worship, how you naturally tend to do things, how you organize life and ministry, how you learn, how you learn scripture and discipleship, and then how you lead, carrying out mission, the work of evangelism. All these are in the Great Commission. Go therefore ye into all the world, baptizing, teaching them, right? All that stuff. Uh, surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. That is the Great Com- Com- Commission. So we're looking at all of that stuff here in this PPK assessment. And then what you're going to do is you're going to come down and you're going to total up the numbers that it lists here. And you might fill in, you know, the number 30 here, and you might fill in the number 15 here, and you might fill in the number 20 here, okay? And you're going to click which one you predominantly are, okay? Right here, how I relate, my number is typically over here. How I do things is typically very kingly, how I organize life, very, very organized. Many people will even comment how I I talk big vision. I, I, I talk a lot of big ideas, but they don't, it, it sometimes freaks certain people out. Whereas with me, when I talk some of those big things, it doesn't freak me out. It actually gets me excited because I see the order of how it all comes together. I can organize it. And that's how I learn. I'm also very, I'm probably very profitly my wife is very, very priestly all the way through. How she organized life, it, people always come first. How she does things, it's always communal. And so she trains me in how to think that way. I'm not saying we can't all be like these. I'm saying my tendency, if I jump into job, if I jump into family, music, creativity, whatever, I naturally am bent to kind of operate through one of these triune lenses and so are you. And if, and it's, that's why this is more than a personality test. It's not just testing your personality and this is who you are all the time. It's saying no, in different realms, like sometimes I'm more kingly, but how I lead, you know, I'm more kingly, but how I organize or uh, how I relate is definitely more profitly. How I learn is definitely more geared towards the profit. Okay. So I have like these ebbs and flows, but it's not so much focused on who I am. It's focused on who he is in me. That's very different. This is absolutely astronomically in my mind, completely different from Myers-Briggs or the love languages. Even though those are helpful, this is different. And then you're going to come to this part where you're going to assess, ask people to kind of tell you who you are. Maybe have them take the test for you and see if they see some of these same tendencies in you. Okay. And then what you're going to do is come to section one and how has, we're answering the question of how God orders life. How has he ordered your life? Well, I think the big thing that comes into play here is his plan in providence. God is sovereign. Has he been watching out for your story since you were born before you even knew that he was watching out for your story? And I want you to list significant events that took place. I know when I did this, I listed a ton of stuff before I was 18 as negative. Just downright negative, just stuff I did. I wasn't saved before I was 18. And so I just listed constant stuff like abuse that I'd incurred, stuff I'd done to people, significant events of hurts with friends and bullying. And I had a lot of this background baggage. And then I noticed after 18, I started turning to these landmarks of, you know, God teaching me this or God helping me meet my wife or, or God doing certain things, landmarks in my life where I learned about him as, as father, as um, him as son, as him as spirit. And what it did was it put my life in perspective because Paul says, count all things past rubbish, right? We're here in the present and to pray about things, all things future so we can live in the present. But I think it's good to put your whole life in perspective. You know, where you've been in the last however many years has shaped your story and it's shaped how God has um, crafting his story into you. That's where this focus is. I want you to hear me. This focus is more on his story than it really does yours. Yes, you're learning more about you, but this is about God revealing himself in you. Okay. And you can tell people the story of God. And then what I have you do is break your life down into chapter titles. You know, like right, like my first, my, uh, first, uh, chapter title was probably religious. Then my second one was um, antagonistic atheist. I was loved belittling Christians. I grew up in a religious home, hated it, loved kind of tearing down Christians. And then my chapter three is God intervenes. 
And that chapter has a whole lot in it for me. It has a uh, contemplation of suicide, depression, a breakup with a girlfriend, the darkest low of my life. If I were to write that chapter, it would talk about God's hope, but it would certainly share a lot about what God has done or I didn't see him doing. And what it did was it just kind of showed me his sovereignty, how he was pressing out his plan in my life, even when I didn't see it. And you, you need to identify how he's pressing out his image in your life before you might have even been aware of it. He was preparing you for something long ago. And that's going to show up in section two through maybe some passions you have. There's going to be some natural words maybe that you draw to on this list. Okay, I, I'm guessing many of the words will go in line with some of the tendencies that you have. They may be more procedure minded. They may be more people minded. They may be more pre, precept minded. You know, I'm really drawn to like the word accountability. I'm really drawn to the word discipline. I'm really drawn to the word creativity. I'm really drawn to the word wisdom. Those are all very, very precept procedure words. My wife, if she went through this, I guarantee you compassion, kindness, servanthood, mercy. It's not that I don't value all these things. I'm saying I'm drawn. This is, this is showing me how I specifically carry out God's mission. Then I want you to take a look at the great commission. I believe there's five pillars. I list them in the beginning. You ministry, discipleship, worship. Um, these are provided, I think, wisely by Rick Warren in Purpose Driven Church, Purpose Driven Life. I think this is one thing he got right. I don't agree with everything, but I think this is one thing he got right. But mark out some of the great pillars that you think are in the Great Commission. Identify them. And you're going to compare them to the findings from your life experience, your personal purpose statement, your cherished values, your, and you're going to combine everything you found up to this point into one statement that you believe defines your life and defines, defines the direction for your life. And it's going to be stated in a way that can be, uh, and mine is reach. I, I've operated by this for 20 years and it's the Great Commission. Reaching where he's working, that's evangelism. I'm looking where our God is working. Experiencing him as I'm walking, that's ministry. Like everywhere I go, I need to experience him. Whether that be prayer, worship, discipleship, evangelism, seeing somebody in need, attaining the fullness of his word, and that's discipleship. I'm in my Bible, I'm, I'm on my knees, I'm trying to become more like him. C, caring for those who are wanting. I believe that Jesus has a specific heart to eat with the sinner to help the marginalized, the widow, the orphan, the imprisoned. And so to me, keeping my eyes open for caring for those who are wanting in any way is the gospel. And so then my last one is honoring him whose glory is my joy. And that's worship. Everything I do is worship. So my mission state is reach. Reaching those who are wanting, experiencing man as I'm walking, attaining the fullness of his word and caring for those who are hurting or wanting and honoring the, honoring him whose glory is my joy. And at the very end, I kind of sum it up and say, am I more the, the hands, you know, the networking, the system, the practical, the task, the kingly, the heart, more emotional, the priestly, the people, or more the head, you know, the concepts, the logic, the message, the why, the prophets answer more the why. Why do we believe? The pre priests answer more who are we believing and who are we loving and who are we believing for? That's loving God, loving others. And kings are how? How are we going to do this? How are we going to carry out this mission? You'll notice even in my reach, it it's, it's telling you how. Okay. Um, and then lastly, you're going to look at Maybe things that get you excited, things that get you angry, things that draw you to tears. Uh, we talk a little bit different about the spiritual giftings. They're more ministries. They, the, the gifting lists that we get are, are less what you see on disc test and spiritual assessments where you just mark off and you're like, well, I have this superpower and I have this superpower. That's not what this is. What Paul lists his ministries in, and you'll see it in my in the book Trinity Worship, they're more descriptions of the whole. It's saying there are ministries kind of like this. They're all like heady. There's kind of like this, hearty. They're kind of like this, more hands-on. And they're describing the ministry themselves. Where I can go through and go, you know, this is this is kind of more me. You know, I'm more, I'm kind of here. You know, I'm probably a little bit here. 
that's I'm more kind of balanced between, and that's going to tell me what part of the Trinity am I best to represent. And I'm probably going to be finding myself in these types of ministries. Okay. It's not the gifts themselves. Paul describes that not like individualistic. He describes them as the ministries themselves, collective, together. We together do these things. So I'm going to find myself more here. It also explains to me where I might find myself in need of something. My wife, for instance, I surround myself very intentionally by priestly people because I just don't think that way. I know I need to be merciful. That's what we're all supposed to do. We're all supposed to be pastoring. We're all supposed to be encouraging and seeking healing for people and serving people. It's not that I don't do those things. It's just, I'm not inclined to naturally think that way. And so this is going to tell you not just who you are, because I feel like Myers-Briggs for so many years, it's kind of dumb people down to this is my world and this is how you fit into me. And this tells you, no, this is my world and here's where I need to fit into other people's life because they, my wife needs more my kingly priestly and I need more her, her, or uh, kingly, or I need more her priestly. She needs more my prophetly and my kingly. She needs more the precept and the procedure. I need more the people from her. And instead of kind of pigeonholing ourselves and saying, this is who I am, deal with it. It's, it's more of a, no, this is who God is. This is how I best reflect him. This is where I need some other help. And this is where I best need to love other people. So I see myself more as a compliment and a liability to people. And I see them more as a compliment and a liability to me. I don't see them as somebody to particularly to say, nope, not going to happen. Say, no, I let you in because I need you. And they don't say to me, well, you're not like me, so I don't hang out with you. And what PPK does is it keeps the church, it keeps us from becoming a homogenous ordered people to where we all look uniform, not unified. We are great at looking uniform. We, we're just like the world. We try to talk the same. The church, you have to believe the same. We become all the same culture, all the same race. We sing all the same songs. And then down the street, we find that the church is very different from us. Because the body of Christ on this side is very different than the body of Christ on this side. But together, when we start to see where we complement each other, we start to see, man, this is all in the body of Christ. And when, when you get down to sacred time, say, section four, you can read that. But basically, it's discussing, and we, we're, we're talking a little bit about how God orders your, um, your thick and your thin rhythms, the daily schedules of your life. Okay. There are moments, there are things in your life that you already consider maybe thick that you plan in your life that have deep meaning. Maybe it's Bible study or church or hanging out with Christian friends. Okay. Prayer time. Then there's other things you consider thin, brushing your teeth, going to work. They don't have much significance. Your job here is to look at your life and see what your purpose statement is, see what your gifting is and see what the great commission is and say, how do I start working those things specifically into my day? If I am naturally gifted as a prophet and king, how do I grow in those? How do I surround myself with stuff to do that brings that strength to bear? How do I surround myself intentionally with priestly things that I don't naturally tend to? I mean, I literally, I very dogmatically plan my priestly activities. Like I plan out who I'm going to hang out with. I plan my family time. I plan dates with my kids. I plan dates with my wife. I block them out every week. They have their own color. And that's my kingly way of doing things. Okay. You may not do it that way, but I literally have to do that because unless I have a space where relationship happens, I naturally just don't do it. And that's my unhealthy thing. That's, I'm not boasting. I'm not saying that, wow, this is good of me. I'm saying, no, this is, this is my serious problem. And because I recognize that, I plan things very intentionally. But look, I went about it like a priest or a king. And I went about it like a prophet. Like, I need to have this complete schematic of truth in my life. So I'm going to plan it out this way to make sure everything gets there. But we all do it differently. But you need to look at the rhythms of your day and realize that God is involved in every part of your story. How are you going to specifically involve him? And then there's sp- sacred time, there's sacred space. How are you going to invite him into those rhythms? And there's some ideas that are given there. Okay. So this is kind of a full plan to say, what is God's story in me up till now? 
And how am I to work his story? How is he working his story into me? And how is his personality being worked into me? It's not about me. It's about him. And then how am I supposed to flesh out his personality to give that to others? And what piece of his personality am I missing from the body of Christ that I need to add into myself, that I need to fellowship with, to gain from? It's completely shifted my perspective to seeing us as a whole unit that need each other. Rather than an individualized faith, it's a collective faith. Okay, And so by the time you get to the end of this, it's going to show up in your day. Your day is going to be plotted very differently. You're going to start thinking more through how God orders life. And that's going to be the purpose of kind of connecting in this class to a personal mentor who knows you, who can now start assessing you. And I think this is maturity. This is something that we go through to kind of um, assess ourselves Continue. I walk through this all the time. I, I go through this all the time to say, how am I growing in God's character? How am I... Am I adding things that are I'm lacking? Am I adding things to people that they're lacking? Where am I using my particular bents, my particular tendencies? Where are people filling up where I'm lacking in, the, in their tendencies? And how am I involving those things in my space, in my schedule, in my time? Intentionally growing, intentionally supplying places where I might not be so strong or deploying things where I may be very strong. And that comes down into us becoming like God. And as you start to work with your assessor in this class, your your mentor, they're going to start walking you through the action plan for ministry and character readiness. Because to serve like Jesus, to be like Jesus said, he said, I'm Christ-like. Christ, he's Christ-like. And he said, I show forth the Father perfectly. So if we're going to become like Jesus, minister like Jesus, be like him in character, we're going to have to know how we relate to this Father and this Spirit and to each other. And that's going to take some intentional focus. Okay, Stay tuned for the next video as you're going to meet with your mentor and talk to this very first step, the community ministry and character readiness part.